Welcome to Navara Live. I'm Michael Walker and back by popular demand, it's Barnaby Rain. Good evening, Michael. It's, uh, it's good to see you again. Good pleasure to have you back on. Coming up later tonight, left-wing Jews who protested against Israeli bombing have been smeared as anti-Semites. A centrist accidentally makes the case for Hamas on the BBC and we'll be discussing international law in the Gaza war with the UK Director of Human Rights Watch. Stay tuned for all of that. The Jabalia refugee camp has again been hit by airstrikes today. Details of the latest blasts are unclear, but it comes only a day after Israel killed dozens of people by bombing the area. This, as reported on the BBC, was the impact of yesterday's airstrikes on the Jabalia refugee camp. An unknown number of people are buried under the rubble. They were pulling out children. He says... Oh God, my three children are gone, three kids. I hope I can find one of them alive. I didn't bid them farewell. Jabalia camp covers just over half a square mile. 116,000 refugees were registered here with the UN before the war. He says it's a massacre, 30 to 40 homes blown to pieces. Bodies everywhere, everyone's looking for their beloved ones. The local hospital was overwhelmed with casualties. The surgical director sent the BBC this video. He said they'd done 15 to 20 amputations. Patients, he said, arrived packed into ambulances with the wounded alongside the dead. We received about 400 injured patients between very seriously injured patients and murder. Yes, yes, you see that the majority of them are children and women. Dr. Elron told me around 120 dead from this afternoon's attack are at the hospital. They ran out of space inside the building. The human cost of those airstrikes, just incredible, unbelievable. And unlike previous atrocities, Israel isn't trying to pass the buck. Very openly, they have said, Yes, we bombed a refugee camp full of innocent men, women and children. And yes, we did it on purpose. And they claim the operation was to kill one, yes, one Hamas commander. He's called Ibrahim Biari. It beggars belief. And even CNN's Wolf Blitzer, who used to work for the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, so an avid Zionist, he seemed to struggle to take that information in. Here he is interviewing an IDF spokesperson after the attack. Even if that uh, uh, Hamas commander was there amidst all those Palestinian refugees who are in that, in that Jabalia refugee camp, Israel still went ahead and, and dropped a bomb there, uh, attempting to kill this, Hamas, uh, this Hamas, Hamas commander, knowing that a lot of innocent civilians, men, women and children, presumably would be killed. Is that what I'm hearing? That's not what you're hearing, Wolf. We, again, were focused on this commander, again, who you'll get more data who this man was. Uh, killed many, many Israelis. Uh, we're doing everything we can. These are, it's a very complicated battle space. There could be infrastructure there. There could be tunnels there. Uh, we're still looking into it, and we'll give you more data as the hour moves ahead. But you know that there are a lot of refugees, a lot of innocent civilians, men, women, and children in that refugee camp as well, right? This is the tragedy of war, Wolf. I mean, we, as you know, we've been saying for days, Move south. Civilians that are not involved with Hamas, please move south. Yeah, uh, I'm just uh, trying to get we, a little bit more information. Uh, you knew there were civilians there. You knew there were refugees, all sorts of refugees. But you decided to still drop a bomb on that refugee camp attempting to kill the Hamas commander. By the way, was he killed? I can't confirm yet. I'll, there'll be more uh, updated. He, Yes, we know that he was killed. Um about the civilians there, we're doing everything we can to minimize. Uh, I'll tell it, I'll see it again. It's just sick, isn't it? We're doing everything we can to minimize it after you've just bombed a refugee camp. Obviously, they're his excuses. We told them to move south. We told them to move south. Now, as I keep saying, last Friday, I interviewed someone whose family lived south of the region, which the Israelis have told people to evacuate. 20, now 21, actually, of his family members have been killed by Israeli airstrikes. So this idea, oh, they could have just gone south and they would have been fine. No, there are actually lots of people going south who then go back to the north because they think, well, in the south, we, we're not in our own homes and we're still getting bombed. So we might as well get bombed in our own homes.
right? Just the decisions that people are having to make. And then you've got an IDF spokesperson saying, oh, this is war, we're doing our best, right? And this does seem pretty open and shut to me. According to the rules of war, any harm you do to civilians has to be proportionate to a military end. And here, Israel has knowingly killed dozens of innocent men, women, and children to try to get to a single commander. That doesn't seem proportionate to me. Yet UK politicians disagree. This morning on Sky News, Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden was asked about the attack. IDF has uh, admitted bombing Jabalaya, a refugee camp, with civilian casualties. Is that still within international law as far as the British government's concerned? Well, look, this is the reality of the conflict uh, with an organisation like Hamas. Hamas is a terrorist organisation that has murdered in cold blood over a thousand innocent Israeli men, women and children and now seeks to hide amongst the civilian population. This is, is a, a yes, very Deputy difficult conflict. Uh, we, we, we continue to urge the, uh, is, the Israeli government to abide by international law. I believe that the Israeli government is continuing to do okay. so against uh, an enemy that hides amongst civilians. It's, it's the terrible nature of this, this appalling conflict. David Lammy didn't go quite so far as Oliver Dowden, but he also thinks the refugee bombing might all have been above board. It's clear to me that it's wrong to bomb a refugee camp. Um, but clearly, if there is a military objective, it, it can be legally justifiable. It's for Israel to explain its actions. So Lamy thinks it might be a war crime to bomb a refugee camp, but we'll have to wait and check Israel's homework. For a more comprehensive view on the laws of war in Israel-Palestine, I spoke earlier today to Yasmin Ahmed. She's UK Director of Human Rights Watch. I asked her how Human Rights Watch assessed the bombing of the Jabalia refugee camp. The bombing of the and the strikes on the refugee camp raise very, very serious questions about whether those strikes complied with international humanitarian law. What is very clear under international humanitarian law is that it is unlawful to carry out indiscriminate attacks, attacks that don't distinguish between the civilian population and military objectives, and also to carry out disproportionate attacks, attacks that have a disproportionate impact on the civilian population or civilian infrastructure when weighed against the military objective and target. What we're very concerned about is that uh, we know that in past conflicts and past hostilities that Israel has, in fact, as has Hamas, uh, breached the laws of war. What we know in the context of Israel is that they have carried out indiscriminate attacks, attacks that have wiped out entire families, that have um, decimated civilian infrastructure, including homes and hospitals, and that they've also attacked civilian uh, infrastructure and civilians when there is no legitimate military target in the proximity. So Human Rights Watch has found that in previous incidents. So I think the main thing to say in relation to this, before we can make any uh, concrete conclusions, because we obviously would need to assess the evidence, is that it is, raises a number of alarm bells and some very serious concerns. Something that I think is often overlooked in the discussion of international law when it comes to the war in Gaza is that these aren't just two independent states fighting each other, right? You've got Israel, mm -hmm. which is whatever anyone else says, it is the occupying power in Gaza because it has controlled what goes in and out of it um, for 17 years. How does that affect the or Human Rights Watch or anyone's assessment of international law in this conflict? Does Israel have sort of extra obligations as an occupying power as well as a combatant? Yes, it, it certainly does. As, as you note, uh, Israel has been an occupying power now for decades of the Palestinian people, and it has repeatedly in that context committed war crimes um, uh, namely, for example, the transfer of its civilian population from its territory into the occupied territories, which we see in in uh, uh, being carried out in the form of the expansion of settlements, which since October the 7th have only got worse in the violence and the appropriation of Palestinian land has only got worse, in particularly in the West Bank. Um, but, yes, certainly the occupying power has 
obligations with respect to those, the population that it occupies. So for example, it must ensure that 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 humanitarian, that, that humanitarian access is provided to that population, that the population has access to humanitarian provision. Um, and it's certainly, so it's certainly in, in terms of the siege, it is not only a war crime, but it's also a direct violation of the responsibilities that Israel has as an occupying power. But I would just note that in relation to Gaza, we're talking about a situation where for over 16 years, uh, they have Israel has abrogated that responsibility entirely by blockading the population into Gaza. Obviously, the siege now has tightened the screws. But what we've seen is that it has certainly abrogated its responsibility. But now we're seeing that abrogation at a much more severe level. A more profound question in a way, which has, has confused me, let's say, over the previous few weeks, is, is keep, people keep saying Israel has the right to defend itself as if that's, you know, completely uncontroversial. And for me, it seems odd that an occupying power can have a right to defend itself against the people it's occupying. Does Human Rights Watch have a stance on that? Or, or what might you be able to tell me about whether it makes sense to say an occupying power has a right to self-defense? I think the, the main thing is uh, here is that when we speak about Israel's right to self-defense, well, I, I really think what this boils down to really is that any response that Israel has to the attacks, the unlawful and attacks by Hamas in terms of the continued indiscriminate attacks and rocket attacks that continue and have continued in the thousands since uh, October the 7th, as well as the war crimes that were committed against civilians. They, whatever, in, in relation to their response and their response in self-defence, that has to comply with international law. And that is the most fundamental point. And what we have seen from, from October the 7th till now is that has not happened. Uh, the uh, Israeli military, the Israeli government has collectively punished an entire civilian population in Gaza for the acts of Hamas. That is clearly a war crime. They have impeded the access of humanitarian services and humanitarian provision into Gaza, which again is a war crime. So I think the, the really the most important thing here uh, is whether Israel's response has been lawful. And what we have seen that in some regards and in very significant regards, it has not been a lawful response. To what extent would the statements of Israeli politicians over the past three weeks sort of support a case um, that war crimes are, are being committed? Because I suppose that would imply intent. I mean, we've seen quite high up ministers um, say that they, uh, they will basically starve Gaza until the hostages are released, which sounds to me like collective punishment. You've had people say that they're prioritising damage over accuracy. And then we've got the Ministry of Information, which seems to have endorsed a plan or at least proposed a plan um, to say that all 2.2 million people should be kicked out of Gaza and we need to make a humanitarian crisis so bad that they're, they're so desperate to flee that they essentially break out. Now, are human rights what sort of collecting the statements made by Israeli politicians where, you know, under many interpretations, they are, they are actively sort of admitting to, to an intent to commit war crimes? Yes, I mean, it's a very good question. So um, Human Rights Watch is, um, on both sides, we collect the statements made by Hamas and other actors, as well as the statements that have been made by the Israeli uh, government and the various, the various entities of the Israeli government. And what I would say is that, obviously, very, very concerning and problematic statements by the Israeli government. So as you've noted, statements that certainly speak to uh, the intention and the, what we would call sort of the mens rea, the mental element of certain crimes. Now, war crimes are serious violations of international humanitarian law, of which hostage taking, collective punishment, uh, attacks against the civilian population um, are, are form part of those. And they, they, those serious violations of international humanitarian law uh, can amount to war crimes where the requisite in a, a mental element has been reached. And that is either a clear intention 
or uh, which is expressed or even recklessness. So these statements certainly speak to the question of whether there was intent or and or recklessness in these circumstances. We're also very, very concerned about the, the statements and about what these statements say in terms of the risk of further atrocities being committed. We've been very clear that atrocities committed by both sides must end indiscriminate attacks by Hamas. All the hostages must be released and must be, while, whilst they re, uh, are under the, uh, the, the control of Hamas, must be treated appropriately, but they must be released. Um, but also with respect to Israel, we're very concerned, particularly in light of its past conduct, that we may see further atrocity crimes, we may see further war crimes being committed. We are very concerned about risks of forcible displacement of population, which amounts to a war crime. Um, and uh, you know, and other crimes that may well be committed in the context of this armed conflict, as we've noted, attacks against civilian civilian objects or civilians, which are indiscriminate or and or disproportionate. So I think that the statements lend a significant credence to the worry that human rights organisations and the UN and many other bodies have in terms of the potential for further commission of atrocities um, by the Israeli government. How much does international law matter in a conflict like this? I mean, is there any prospect that, that leaders on either side will be tried at The Hague? And if not, is there any reason why they should sort of pay attention to international law or is it really just might makes right? Um, you've got two sides trying to achieve military aims and you know they might talk a nice talk about trying to follow international law, but do they really care if they do or not? The first thing to say is that the International Criminal Court has an investigation, it opened an investigation into activities on the occupied Palestinian territories. The investigation was opened in 2021 and it dates back to 2014. So we'll be looking and the, uh, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court has confirmed that current the current situation and incidences that are happening in the occupied Palestinian territories, as well as acts which are carried out by Hamas um, in the occupied Palestinian territories towards Israel, but also within Israel as well, will fall within its jurisdiction. The reason why it has that ability is because Palestine signed up to the Rome Statute and the court accepted its signatory, whereas unfortunately Israel continues like the United States States continues to refuse to sign up to the International Criminal Court, the Rome Statute. However, because Palestine has, it means that anything that happens within the occupied Palestinian territories can be investigated and will be now investigated by the court. We saw Karim Khan standing at the Rafah border in Egypt talking about the importance of the parties to comply with international humanitarian law and the fact that active investigations are ongoing. In terms of the likelihood, I would say that international justice is a long road. Often it may seem impossible at the time, but what we have seen is incidences where either the International Criminal Court or domestic courts have acted to hold uh, leaders to account. And so what, what I mean by domestic courts is that courts around the world, countries around the world, have a requirement to exercise what we call universal jurisdiction, um, which means that if someone arrives on its territory and they are accused of of a of one of these sort of very egregious international crimes, then courts within that jurisdiction can hear that crime. We have seen, for example, recently in the Netherlands, a case against a Syrian official, intelligence official, um, who was um, convicted for the commission of crimes in Syria. So we have seen the exercise of universal jurisdiction. We saw, for example, Pinochet in, in the United Kingdom um, being uh, prosecuted. We've seen other instances of that happening. So I would say that whilst international criminal law is not the silver bullet by any means to solve this problem or to um, or that we will see um, People, we will see uh, uh, Israeli officials in the dock tomorrow or Hamas officials in the dock tomorrow. I think that what we can say is the arc of justice can be quite long, but it has served in certain instances. And I think Israel and Hamas should be on warning now that when they are traveling around the world, we've already seen instances where states now have withdrawn their diplomatic relations. There are states now who are very 
very concerned and have expressed their concern through very formal ways about what Israel has done. So I think, you know, there isn't there is a chance that, you know, and a, certainly a warning for Israeli officials who may have been implicated, in, as well as uh, leaders who um, are also responsible if they knew or had reason to know these crimes were being committed, um, that they may, in fact, face justice and find themselves in the dock. The Rafa crossing between Gaza and Egypt has opened for the first time since Israel's assault on Gaza began 26 days ago. On the Gazan side of the crossing, people began to queue shortly after 7am local time when news of the border opening was announced. The Egyptian authorities say that over 500 people who hold foreign passports will be permitted to leave Gaza and enter Egypt today. This is footage of the first ambulances to be allowed to cross from Gaza into Egypt. Egypt has said it will allow around 80 injured Palestinians to be transported into the country for treatment. The deal between Hamas, Israel and Egypt was negotiated by Qatar and the US. But given that more than 22,000 Palestinians have been injured in the Israeli bombardment, it won't make a huge difference to the catastrophe unfolding inside the territory. For those who remain, their prospects for medical treatment look increasingly bleak. Gazan hospitals are struggling to find the fuel, supplies and medicines they need to continue functioning. And with people suffering horrific injuries from blasts, burns and collapsing buildings, there's a huge demand for surgery. Last week, the Financial Times published this story about a hospital in southern Gaza. Doctors at the NASA hospital in Khan Yunus are being forced to perform surgeries without anaesthetic while they run out of basic supplies and fuel. This video from Médecins Sans Frontières contains a harrowing description of one such operation. Our OT was full, so we start to operate the urgent cases in the land in the corridor. This lady, which you see, it's the mother, which put his uh, young daughter, about 13 years old, in the wheelchair. And in the land here, I operate, or the young son, it's a nine-year-old, which have a semi-amputated foot. We lack of instrument and we have a lot of cases so we just amputated under slight sedation you can see this the other guy he's the anesthesia try to let his mouth open to prevent him from strangulation so we amputate him in face to his mother and his sister because there is no space and the sister is waiting for another operation you cannot imagine this the girl this 13 years old wait for operation and see me that's i amputate the midfoot of his brother. But actually, this is the situation. This is our best. We cannot do more. And we hope that you can deliver this this photo to the world, all the world. I mean, it's really important organizations like Medicines on Frontier are posting those videos to the world, but it does seem like so many in, in Western positions of power are very unwilling to listen. They're unwilling to put any pressure on Israel whatsoever to, to stop enforcing, imposing these conditions on a people that's put under siege for 17 years and is now bombing, right? It isn't just the injured, though, who are enduring horrific conditions as doctors try to save their lives. The bombardment has also meant bringing new life into the world has become a potentially deadly ordeal. The Times published this article today. Expectant mothers are now enduring caesarean sections without anaesthetic, while doctors perform the procedure by torchlight amid power blackouts. A caesarean is a major operation, but according to humanitarian agency CARE, in some of those cases, women are being discharged from hospital just three hours after giving birth, all while antibiotics and painkillers are in short supply too. And even if a woman has a natural childbirth, it's in a panicked environment with bombs falling and no home to go to afterwards, potentially, of course, or no safe home to go to afterwards. Channel 4 News spoke to one of those women. This is Lena, who gave birth to twins in the second week of the war. Lena made it to a hospital. Her twins were born as bombs landed all around them. 
اسبانيا اوريك اول ما شفتي انبسطت عليهم حلوين اعطوني امل I went on GB News yesterday with Kelvin McKenzie, really horrific guy. I did bring up a very racist tweet he, he, he made last week. But he was essentially saying, all Gazans are the enemy. All Gazans are the enemy, and so they're fair game. You look at a video of, of those two newborn babies, and essentially that's what these right-wingers are talking about. They say, I'm so glad Israel is finally um, bombing to smithereens, Gaza, including newborn babies and, and new mothers. It just makes me sick, right? The UN Population Fund says there are around 50,000 pregnant women in Gaza. Around 5,000 of them are expected to give birth within the next month. So these are the conditions you can expect in a Gazan hospital, right? No anesthetic. Operations performed on floors. Continuous bombing. And that's if you even get to one. The Palestinian Red Crescent has released this footage documenting the dangers that ambulance drivers now face in the Strip. <laughs> ايوه ايوه قدامنا قدامنا قدام Palestinian Red Crescent has now also said that it's reduced the number of ambulances it operates, that's due, due to fuel shortages. And Gaza's only cancer treatment hospital is now shut down because it has no fuel either. Barnaby, day after day after day, we are just seeing these horrific scenes. I mean, it's also the case that Israel now seem to be suggesting that they think this is going to be a long war. So we could be seeing scenes such as this for weeks, potentially even months to come. We heard today from doctors in Gaza saying that they're not resuscitating patients um, sometimes because the ventilators that they would use to resuscitate those patients, they can't get fuel for. So people who signed up to be doctors because they wanted to save lives have been placed under a strangling siege in a situation where even those most committed to the saving of life are being rendered unable to save lives by this siege. They're worrying now in hospitals about whether they can keep generators running, which are providing um, uh, the fuel that is keeping lots of patients alive. They might have to uh, just let those patients die because they are dealing with such a lack of fuel. So that's the blanket of death, the blanket of death that is being spread across people who want to live. Why? Well, firstly, because as you just mentioned, Michael, um, some people, including several Israeli generals and politicians, have been very clear that they don't see any distinction between Hamas and the whole population of Gaza. And I think it's worth taking them seriously there, and it's worth investigating that kind of claim. Their supporters overseas have said it too. Tom Cotton, the American senator, said it. Why? Well, it's because they know that Hamas is not really ISIS. Hamas is not really a force of foreigners lured to a place they've never been by the promise of glitzy things to oppress the locals. They know that Hamas and other groups were able to recruit almost 2,000 people to enter Israel on October the 7th. They know that Hamas has some kind of base in Gaza, and they know that even where lots of people in Gaza may disagree with Hamas in all kinds of ways, people in Gaza don't want to live as refugees penned into an open-air prison. They don't want to live under siege. They don't want to live as second-class citizens or third-class citizens or occupied people who aren't citizens at all in their own homeland peered at down the gun of an occupier, penned in by checkpoints and settlements, driven from their homes as Palestinians in the West Bank are now being driven from their homes by armed settlers given guns by the Israeli state. The Israelis know that Palestinians don't want to live like that, aren't prepared to accept a future like that. And so it isn't just a small militant group that Israel has to destroy. It's the Palestinian people. And that's the great tragedy of all colonial projects. You dispossess others. You must repress the dispossessed in order to try to suppress their resistance and their attempt to take back the land and the homes that you've stolen from them. So that's the basic underlying dynamic of Israeli violence in Gaza. Not a war between two countries, not a conflict between two equal sides, but a colonial power seeking to maintain the facts of its dispossession. That's what Israeli self-defense means. A colonial power seeking to maintain the facts of its dispossession against a dispossessed people who want to undo that dispossession to live 
um, as citizens of a cosmopolitan society, not as settlers and occupied people in a, uh, not as the gun-toting sheriffs as Israelis now live of, of, a, of a settler fortress. That's the choice, a settler fortress or a cosmopolitan society where everyone lives as citizens. That's why the Palestinian liberation struggle promises to free not just Palestinians, but ultimately Israelis too, from the paranoias of the settler uh, to live with their neighbors as human beings. But there's a second reason why Israeli violence appears so indiscriminate. And it's because Hamas is, again, not like ISIS, but like other anti-colonial movements, like the Viet Cong, for example, in Vietnam, they work through a network of tunnels which is what you do if you're in a densely populated, uh, highly urban area, which is subject to a land, air and sea blockade. Um, they, they smuggle things uh, and they fight through a network of tunnels. And that means that if Israel wants to destroy Hamas's military infrastructure, which they consistently say they want to destroy, they can't just blow up a building. They have to get to those tunnels underground. And that means they want to get to everything above ground that may be above those tunnels. So they do a blanket bombing campaign to try to destroy hospitals, schools, family homes, um, journalist buildings. They destroyed the Al Jazeera Tower, remember, Um, uh, in order to wipe out life on some of the surface of Gaza so that they can then send their troops in and attack those tunnels underground. They've talked about just uh, sending poisonous gases into those tunnels. They know that if they do that, they would get their own hostages. Israel's in fact been put in a difficult, who who are being hidden by Hamas in those tunnels. Israel's been put in a very difficult position by Hamas's military strategy here, uh, which was to pull hostages back into Gaza and keep them in those tunnels. So it's hard for Israel to then know what to do uh, uh, by targeting those tunnels without uh, attacking their own hostages. That's why they've been in such a kind of confused pause about whether to go in and do a ground invasion or not. They know the risks are really great and they know that Hamas knows the territory well and will be able to resist them in a, in a fight, um, in a ground war. And so they prefer to just bomb them indiscriminately from the air. So that's the situation. You've got a, a, a colonial power that knows that its enemy is the colonized population. And you've got a colonial power that even if it just wanted to destroy a guerrilla movement among the colonized population, um, knows that the total destruction of that guerrilla movement basically requires the total destruction of the territory because it's operating underground. So faced with that choice, Israel, its state, its military, its people, and its supporters overseas have two options. Either you proceed in attempting to totally destroy a dispossessed people, muffle, silence, and murder them so that you can live atop their broken homes, go to the beach in Tel Aviv and party in peace, and be aware that the cost of that will be utter devastation, will be tens of thousands of deaths. Or you say, people have been dispossessed, they're living under a siege. It's time to talk to them. It's time to work out a future in which we live together. And that might require, I think it will require, giving up uh, your colonial supremacy and your gun-toting uh, sheriff fortress state. But those are the two choices. And if Israel is committed to maintaining the facts of its dispossession, it is then committed to enormous violence in order to sustain that fact against a guerrilla movement and against the uh, Palestinian people who've been dispossessed. I've uh, seen Kamala Harris is, is, is currently visiting and um, Rishi Sunak, and she sort of said, Gaza, sorry, Hamas will not be allowed to be a governing power in, in Gaza, which is essentially the Americans again asking for regime change. Uh, they've looked at how good this has gone for them um, over the past two decades. I mean, you could say over the past century almost. Um, you say, oh, we don't like this government, we're going to overthrow it. Because of course, you're right, right? Hamas is not ISIS. Hamas has been the government of Gaza for the past 17 years, in many cases bolstered by Israel because they prefer having Hamas as their opposition to, to a party which is interested in, in a two-state solution in the peace process. So Netanyahu for a while thought that this was a gamble that was paying off for the Israelis. It's less clear now. Um, but yeah, it still seems like Israel and their allies think it's a reasonable thing to do to try and bomb uh, a government out of existence and then hope that someone else reigns over the ruins. Um, of course, the other proposal, which is being put forward by many in the Israeli right, and I say many people who are very close to, to Netanyahu, in fact, is to say, well, it's going to be too difficult to get rid of, of Hamas and sort of have some different occupying force or some different governing force. So we just got to clear the whole strip. And to clear the whole strip, what you've got to do is, is create a humanitarian crisis, which is so severe um, that people try and, you know, have a riot at the Rafa crossing. So Egypt doesn't want to accept refugees, um, but what they want to do is create a humanitarian crisis so dire that people sort of force that situation on, on Egypt by, by storming the Rafa crossing. And these tunnels actually give the Israelis a really perfect sort of pretext to do this because obviously no one can see the tunnels, right? So they can just bomb anything and say, well, there was a tunnel underneath. How, how does anyone 
find out whether that intelligence was correct or not. The Israelis just say, oh, sorry, we bombed that hospital. Sorry, we bombed that school. There was a tunnel underneath. Now, there are some people sort of saying, as if it's common sense, actually, um, in sort of international analysis, that of course Israel wants to limit the harm it does to civilians because the more civilians it kills, the more international pressure it faces. Now, I'm sure there is some element of truth to that in that the logic does make sense. Israel does, you know, it is subjected to international pressure when it kills civilians. At the same time, if what Israel wants to do is clear out the Gaza Strip, then killing civilians does serve that purpose, right? So killing civilians for the Israelis has positives as well as negatives. So I really don't think we should take as a given that they are even trying to minimize civilian life. I mean, obviously, they're not trying very hard, but do they even want to minimize civilian life? Or are they actually quite happy to have this alibi of tunnels underground so they can kill as many people as possible? And um, Barnaby, I suppose briefly, your comments on, it's very recent news, but Kamala Harris sort of saying to, to Rishi Sunak or saying alongside Rishi Sunak that Hamas cannot be a governing force in, in Gaza. It's not the first time it's been said. Indeed, in the British Parliament, uh, MPs pressured Rishi Sunak to launch a regional peace initiative, which they said would be designed to exclude Hamas. Um, it's not new that colonized people are uh, treated as pieces on a chessboard. And when they choose leadership, of course, they did vote Hamas into power a long time ago. I think there should be fresh elections. But whenever there's a chance of fresh elections for the Palestinian leadership, Israel moves against that um, to prevent that because they don't want a unified, democratically accountable uh, Palestinian movement. They fund and support instead a highly corrupt government in the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, which shoots Palestinian protesters when they try to march in solidarity with Gaza. So it's very common for colonizers and their allies to try to pick and choose who colonized people are represented by um, and to ensure in a further silencing of the Palestinian people in Gaza that, um, that they don't have a voice unless it's a voice approved by those who are funding the weapons that brutalize them. Let's remember that American tax dollars are siphoned off to Israel in order to fund the imprisonment of the Palestinian people. Israel could not um, continue to treat Palestinians as second-class citizens, as occupied non-citizens, without the American dollars that allow it to build its system of military infrastructure that surveils and abuses Palestinians. So when the leader of the state, which is helping to fund the dispossession of Palestinians and the continued colonization and occupation of Palestinians, says that she wants to decide who Palestinians are represented by, I think that tells you something about the kinds of logics of racial hierarchy that exist in our world. If you're a British citizen, you get to vote for who you want to be represented by. It's a limited form of democracy. I'd like much more. But if you are a Palestinian, you are just a piece on a chessboard, and the Americans and the Israelis will decide who speaks for you so they can decide who betrays you. Before we move on to our next story, I'd like to say thank you to every one of our viewers who has chosen to support our journalism. You are the reason we can bring you this show. And if you're new here, um, thank you for tuning in and please consider supporting us so we can continue to grow the channel and Navarra Media as a whole. To sign up for as little as £1 per month, just go to navarramedia.com slash support. That link is in the description below. We really do appreciate it. As the war crimes of Israel continue in Gaza, protests across the world are continuing to grow. On Tuesday, scores of protesters descended on Liverpool Street Station in London, calling for a ceasefire and an end to the siege. You can see there are a sit-down protest, Palestinian flags waved, lots of people chanting for a ceasefire. Now, some people might think it's heartening to see people protest against the bombing of hospitals and refugee camps. But not everyone agrees. Historian Simon Sharma tweeted this. Don't anyone tell me how peaceful and humane these demonstrations are. Intifada at the railway station. Now, interestingly, in the video Sharma is sharing, protesters are not shouting intifada. Listen for the chant here. So they're very clearly chanting ceasefire now. I don't, I don't know how you get intifada, intifada. Inti I, I don't know how you would hear that and think that they were shouting intifada. Um, Sharma did accept he got that wrong, um, but only 20 hours later. So he'd got a lot of retweets um, before he retracted. Um, in terms of people hearing what they want to hear as well, Rachel Riley tweeted the same clip, exactly the same clip we've just shown you there, and complained people were chanting jihad now, jihad now. 
um, she went on to delete that as well, presumably accepting that they were in fact chanting ceasefire now. Um, Karen Pollock was a, another tweeter, unimpressed by the display of solidarity for Palestinians. Pollock is chief executive of the Holocaust Educational Trust. And she said this, it should not be difficult to understand or recognize that this is an intimidating atmosphere for Jewish people on their way home from work. Many have had to turn back. Chants from the river to the sea are calling for the destruction of Israel, the only Jewish state, enough. Now, interestingly here, you can see a banner, which is actually in the video, which is shared by Karen Pollock saying, Jews against genocide. So she's saying Jews will be intimidated by this. Clearly, there are a fair few number of Jews there um, who are against genocide. And considering she's from the Holocaust Memorial Society, one would have thought that Jews against genocide would be something she would be somewhat amenable to taking on board. The government got in on the Act 2. Transport Secretary Mark Harper said this. The situation earlier this evening at Liverpool Street Station will have been of concern to many people. I've been in contact with British Transport Police and will be meeting officers later this week. Everyone should feel safe when using our rail network. In terms of coverage of the protest from the mainstream media, though, so I've sort of shown you some sort of interest groups, um, pundits, politicians. This is how the media covered it. This is from The Express. Pro-Palestine protesters locked down major London station creating rush hour commuter chaos. And this is a subheading. A sea of people have been pictured in the centre of London's Liverpool Street station, many of which are armed with emotively written banners. Barnaby, does anyone have anything to fear from protesters armed with emotively written banners? When people are chanting ceasefire now under a banner that reads Jews against genocide, if you're threatened by that, you might want to consider that you may be on the wrong side. I think it's important, though, to understand why people are threatened by that. It's important to understand something about how Zionism works, how it thinks. It represents both an attempt to enter into a kind of whiteness, to lose, um, well, Daniel Kahn, one of my favorite uh, Yiddish songwriters, sums up Zionism as, who wouldn't want to win when all we'd ever done was lose? Uh, it's an attempt to remove Jews from one kind of coalition of the um, marginalized, excluded, exploited, and loathed by Western civilization, which is what Jews always were, uh, since the death of Jesus at least, um, and to put us in another coalition, the coalition of the winners of the Western and the powerful. Theodore Herzl had been an assimilationist, the founder of modern political Zionism, had wanted Jews to give up on their Jewishness, and his turn to Zionism was a kind of recognition, in my mind, that the only way to become good Europeans was ironically to leave Europe in order to have what all good Europeans had, which was a nation state, ideally a colonial nation state. So on the one hand, Zionism is a supreme form of attempted entry into whiteness. Um, and, uh, and that's, of course, how Palestinians encounter it uh, as, a, as a process of European colonization. But in its own mind, and to many Jews, um, it, it's also sustained by the deep anxieties of histories of persecution, which mean that when you see people objecting to carnage, when you see people objecting to hospitals being bombed, if you um, have been taught a tradition that worries about your own marginalization and persecution, as I was, as I was raised, then it's easy to read every kind of declaration uh, of solidarity with those being uh, massacred um, as, as an attack on you. The beautiful message then, the wonderful truth uh, that the anti-Zionist Jew learns is that in fact, we can be part of those coalitions that we were part of for centuries. The coalitions that yearn not for our protection um, at someone else's cost, but for a kind of universal freedom. This was never the only Jewish tradition, but it was one, one Jewish tradition. That's that generalized from our own experience of persecution and domination to seek a world without persecution and domination for anyone that knew when European colonizers spoke a language of hatred to inferior others, that they had honed that language over centuries in Europe against Jews who were not simply regarded as inferior, but as crafty and terrifying outsiders who could come to dominate them. We know that the fear of others and the attempt to dominate them was honed against us. And so we as Jews seek to do the most Jewish thing of all, which is to be in the crowd at Liverpool Street, to be in the demonstrations in London and in other cities and towns over recent weeks that have been full of people from every background, united only by horror at the carnage and hope that people can be free. We know that the most Jewish thing of all is to be there opposing a whole world order of Western civilization that was for so long predicated on our destruction and is now predicated on the destruction of others. And so the really Jewish thing to do is not to join that awful kind of civilization, but is to follow the words of our great prophet Isaiah who chastised Jews for fasting and said, uh, you hope that God will bless you because you're fasting, but this is not a real fast. A real fast 
is when you stop oppressing your workers and let the captives go free. That's the message that our prophetic tradition brings to us. Do not mistreat a stranger for you were once a stranger in a strange land. Let my people go, said Moses to Pharaoh in Egypt. And when they left, they didn't leave alone, but they took with them the mixed multitude from Egyptian society, the oppressed and exploited who wanted to escape too. So that's the great Jewish tradition. And people may be intimidated by it because their minds have been, um, have been conquered for so long by Zionism and anxiety. But there is a much more beautiful and, and really rich and true Jewish tradition that could bring people out onto those protests. So I hope to see lots of Jews on these protests, as we've seen hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of Jews in Jewish blocks and all over the demonstrations in recent weeks. My knowledge of scripture isn't amazing, so I won't try and um, pick you up on, on any of those points. I'm going to have to take that as a given. Um, I, I want to show one more response to the protest, which I found actually, I think this is what I found the most grotesque. Um, and it's from the Jewish labor movement. So they have tweeted, so they're tweeting uh, a, a tweet by Lee Harpin, who works for the Jewish Chronicle. And he is pointing out that Pfizer Shaheen has posted a video on her Instagram of this protest. And the Jewish labor movement say this, we expect all labor parliamentary candidates, not least those with sizable Jewish communities in the seat they're contesting, to take more care sharing material, which is more likely to inflame community tensions than calm them. Aspiring MPs should bring people together. Now, I was spoken to Pfizer Shaheen. She said that actually, and she told Lee Harp in this, she wasn't on the demonstration. Obviously, I don't think there would be anything. I think it would be great if she was on the demonstration. She shared this video. And Lee Harpin from the Jewish Chronicle making a big deal of this, I think, you know, that's to be expected. He is basically a troll. But the Jewish labor movement sort of saying about a Muslim prospective parliamentary candidate, oh, why is this prospective parliamentary candidate at this demo? That could offend people from certain communities. Well, the Jewish labor movement just yesterday, actually, backed Keir Starmer's opposition to a ceasefire. They're saying a ceasefire would be the wrong thing to do. And I'd have to say to the Jewish labor movement, do you not recognize that there are some communities in the UK that think opposing a ceasefire is damaging to community tensions? I don't know if they've noticed, but it is the case. It's not just Muslims who are opposed to this dreadful war, but it is disproportionately Muslims who feel incredibly passionate about the fact that the, the carpet bombing of the Gazans is not a good thing. So when JLM sort of say, no, we're absolutely opposed to a ceasefire, I don't see that as, as a group of people who are prioritizing you know, peace between different communities. And, and, and so it seems to me that there is this demand that Muslims are very, very um, considerate of, of even the mere notion that they might offend uh, a Jewish person's um, perspective when it comes to foreign policy. But when it comes to a, a Muslim who might be offended by um, a, a perspective on foreign policy, i.e. we should keep bombing Gazans, they don't seem to have to show the same sensitivity. Barnaby, what do, you, what do you make of this? I find this very concerning, actually. It is concerning how quickly we slip from discussion of Israel and Israeli crimes to discussion of Jews and Jewish feelings and thoughts and concerns in Britain. It is a conflation that is, of course, endemic to anti-Semites to collapse any distinction between the Israeli state and world Jewry, to read the Israeli state simply as the voice of every Jew all over the world. And it is a conflation that means that if I walk to synagogue wearing a kippah, a skull cup, um, I am more likely to be attacked. And so the left does extremely important work in clarifying that the state of Israel is just another settler colonial state. The state of Israel exists as a byproduct of Western imperialism. The state of Israel exists as a violent society uh, predicated on the domination of natives and supported by Western power, which sees in it a regional ally, just as apartheid South Africa existed and just as Algeria existed and just as Vietnam existed and just as uh, uh, so many settler colonial societies across the world have existed, propped up by imperial violence. In other words, the fact of the Jewishness of the state of Israel, though it is crucial to Israelis and to Zionists, is certainly not what matters to Palestinians who don't care what the religion of their colonizer and dispossessor is, but care that they've been colonized and dispossessed. So insisting constantly on the fact of Israel's Jewishness as the most important thing about it is both a mechanism for putting Jews in danger in Britain by associating Israel not with a problem of imperialism that we have to destroy, but with Jews. And it is also a mechanism for silencing yet again, of course, here's the colonial hierarchy, the experiences of Palestinians for whom the Holocaust is a deep tragedy, but not one that 
they committed, for whom centuries of European Christian anti-Semitism are a deep tragedy, but not crimes that they committed, and who wish to live in peace and freedom in their own homes, but are told when they ask to live in peace and freedom in their own homes, that they're not sufficiently considering the feelings of the people who've colonized them and stolen their homes. Just think for a minute what it would be like to experience that. If you're watching this right now, and you're, you know, we hear a lot about Muslim community feelings. It's not just about the Muslim community. If you're from anywhere in the world that was colonized, you know something about how that feels. To have your land taken from you, your history taken from you, your history just becomes another narrative that you like to tell, um, your food taken from you and claimed as the food of the colonizer, everything about your identity and experience taken from you, either denied and ignored or actively maligned and suspected, you're called a terrorist, you're called all kinds of judgmental things, and your experience isn't played back in the world. The experience of the colonizer is instead played again and again and again. That is an experience that is common to everyone from South Africans to black people in America uh, uh, growing up reading literature until at least very recently, where all the good guys in kids' stories were white faces. The idea of the complete invisibilizing of your experience is something that will be familiar not just to Muslims, though it's certainly familiar to Muslims after 20 years after 9-11 in Britain, but to so many people from all over the world. But if you're white, I ask you to imagine it. Because it's not something familiar to you that your experiences are not taken uh, seriously. So, so there's a lot of very concerning things going on here. And the left has a very important role to play constantly in opposing anti-Semitism, which always rises in times like this. And there is a rise in anti-Semitism now, a violent and a dangerous and a worrying rise from Dagestan to London. It is very important that we have the left to oppose that anti-Semitism, to oppose it regardless of what its victims think about the state of Israel, to have a principled opposition to anti-Semitism in all cases, and to stress that we want a world in which everybody lives in freedom, whether they're Jewish, Christian, or Muslim. And yes, we think that includes the taking apart of a state apparatus predicated on domination, the Zionist state in Palestine, so that everyone from the river to the sea can live in equality and freedom. That's our vision. And that's the vision that leads people in Liverpool Street Station to chant ceasefire now. And those who would talk about threats to Jews while having nothing to say or actively supporting violence against others, they're not consistent anti-racists. Barnaby, I want to talk about you specifically. You were featured in media coverage of protests on Tuesday. Anti-Zionist activists restrained by police after rushing at car driving Starmer. And Barnaby Rain had tweeted after Hamas's 7th of October atrocities. Shabbat Shalom and may every colonizer fall everywhere. Um, they've picked up that tweet as the most controversial thing you've said over the past few weeks, Barnaby. Um, any thoughts? Do you stand by it? What do you make of uh, this story about you in Jewish news? Yes, well, firstly, I didn't plan to uh, chase Keir Starmer's car. If I had planned it, I would have pulled up my trousers a bit, Michael, to be honest. Um, so um, uh, I looked a bit messy. Um, it's just that a powerful politician ran into a car, um, a man who wields great influence right now and who aspires to hold a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. And it seemed like the only decent thing to do to say as loudly and clearly as I could and as the people with me could, um, two words, ceasefire now, please do all you can to try to stop the slaughter. That seemed like a kind of urgent um, imperative. So I found myself running after his car uh, with my trousers falling down a bit, um, shouting that at him. Um, probably not my finest moment, but I, I stand by it. And I, I certainly stand by the tweet. You know, Isaac Deutscher, the great uh, a Jewish historian and scholar, had this moment in the early years of the state of Israel where he noticed that Israel was a kind of strange historical anomaly. He said Israel's emerging at the wrong moment because that moment, 1948, the birth of the state of Israel, was the middle of an anti-colonial tide all around the world where other settler colonial and just imperial projects were being uh, torn down. Anti-Zionist Jews actually spend a lot of time de-exceptionalizing Israel. It's not uh, a totally unique place. It's just another imperial settler colonial project. And so I want a world where everybody lives in peace and freedom. And I think that that requires the downfall of a system of colonization predicated on dispossessing people and then suppressing them when they try to oppose the fact of their dispossession. It means that I want freedom for Palestinians. And it also means that I want freedom for Israelis to cease to be um, um, the... Uh, occupiers and the settlers and to become instead human beings who can live with their neighbors. I think that it brutalizes the soul 
And here's my selfish opposition to Zionism as a Jew. I think that it has brutalized and damaged the Jewish uh, uh, soul that we have become um, uh, uh, not a people waiting for the coming of the Messiah and trying to bring it about um, with all the effort that we can, whether you understand that as keeping Shabbos or whether you understand that as fighting for a better world, um, to kun olam, to mend the world. We have, we have shifted uh, from a people who aspire to be a light unto the nations and work for a time when the lion shall lie down with the lamb and, and have become um, uh, European settlers uh, stealing other people's land. I think that's done enormous damage. And I think that freedom and peace for everyone requires the end of that colonial project. Um, and so when I saw on that Saturday morning, a prison fence being broken open in Gaza, um, that was all I'd seen at that point. Um, I thought I want the, the, the victory of every anti-colonial possibility, um, uh, not more death and destruction, uh, never more death and destruction, but, but certainly a world where people can all live in freedom. Yes, yeah, so I suppose it, if people are taking it a bit literally. The colonizers falling, and then they look at the people who who fell on that day and call them and say you're calling them colonizers. So you could see how someone might get offended there, but you're sort of clarifying there that it was before some of those scenes became apparent. Harry Lambert is a staff writer and editor at the New Statesman, and he thinks a ceasefire in Gaza is an impossible ask. I think it's true that a ceasefire only does one thing, it freezes the current conflict, as Keir Starmer says yesterday. And so whether in Ukraine or in Israel, if you're calling for a ceasefire, you're saying you're content with where things are right now. I don't think that should be the case in Ukraine. It means a fifth of the country would be under Rus Russian subjugation. And I think it's untenable to expect the Israelis not to try and remove Hamas from the Gaza Strip. The way they're going about it is um, not something that I think you can easily condone. Uh, that there's clearly a tragedy, a humanitarian one, happening here. But it's impossible to call for a ceasefire. You can't have a ceasefire because that freezes thing in, things in place. Harry, do you know who else made that argument? It was Hamas in the 1990s when the PLO agreed to put down their arms. Right? So they said, we're going to put down our arms and start negotiating. Hamas said, well, if you put your arms down now, um, that's going to freeze things in place. We need to keep fighting. And the reference to Ukraine just makes the argument even more perfect. So he says, Ukraine couldn't possibly agree to put down arms when Russia occupies a fifth of their land. Well, does Harry know how much of Palestine is occupied by the Israelis? 100%. 100%. Presumably then, he thinks it would be mad. It'd be crazy to ask them to renounce violence when 100% when of their land is being subjugated, occupied by a foreign power. I think this new statesman journalist has just accidentally made Hamas's case for them. Um, not saying I agree. I think he was making a very bad argument, actually. Um, but it does seem somewhat bizarre, doesn't it? He's talking about a, a people who are occupied and therefore they must keep fighting. Um, and he's applying that to the Ukrainians, but not the Palestinians. Yes, yeah, far be it for you, Michael, to agree with uh, a Hamas argument. Um, I should say part of the structure we live in in Britain having these conversations is that people can indeed go on TV and uh, celebrate the IDF as they bomb hospitals and refugee camps. And we are frequently treated to commentators on our TV screens celebrating and applauding that Israeli violence. But of course, if you were to, and I'm not doing it, if you were to um, celebrate and promote Hamas, uh, that is illegal. Um, in this land of free speech that would be support for a prescribed terrorist organization. Um, this new statesman journalist is, is parroting exactly what Keir Starmer said yesterday. And it did genuinely shock me. And I think I, I, I thought I was past shock uh, when it came to people like Keir Starmer um, and their colonial double standards. But it did genuinely shock me to hear the argument that we should oppose a ceasefire because that would leave Hamas's military capacities um, intact. It was a very revealing thing to say. Uh, here's what's wrong with it. First, a ceasefire would, of course, leave both sides with their military capacities intact. So the argument makes very clear that in this brutal situation, uh, the outsider's Western British position is not just that it's a horrible situation, we hope the fighting stops, but to side with Israel, to worry not at all about Israel's military capacities being left undamaged, but to worry only about Palestinian military capacities being left undamaged, even though Israel's military capacities have done infinitely more harm, killed infinitely more people um, than have Palestinian military capacities. So the worry only about Hamas is very telling. But secondly, secondly, uh, 
To say we can't have a ceasefire because Israel must destroy Hamas, when Hamas operates through a network of underground tunnels, when that destruction means the blanket destruction of much life in Gaza, is to believe that there can be a military solution to an evidently political problem that a population of 2.2 million people is penned into a small area because most of them are refugees from other parts of Palestine. Those people are placed under a colonial siege where every bit of food and water they get is at the behest of their colonizer who can shut it down at will. So here we have politicians abroad saying, we don't have any immediate questions about any of that. We think first Israel needs to try to crush, impossibly to crush, the guerrilla operation of the resistance coming out of Gaza. And then maybe we can have a conversation about other things only after Israel's completely destroyed the capacity of Palestinians to resist after decades in which Israel has failed to destroy the capacity of Palestinians to resist, just like every other colonizer has, because if you wipe out an organization, another one emerges in its place because people refuse. This is something about the human spirit. People refuse to live forever on their knees. People insist on living, standing up and breathing and living free. So the position that says we oppose a ceasefire now, that says let's have a humanitarian pause so for a week we'll give people food and then we'll start bombing them again and depriving them of food and water again. That position is so deeply telling because it treats dispossessed and colonized people as objects to be managed and destroyed, not as people who have rights to the kind of freedom and dignity that we have here in Britain. I think you're being overly generous there. I think uh, I've been interpreting a humanitarian pause to be a kind of 12-hour or 24-hour period. I hadn't realized that Keir Starmer um, was calling for a, for a week um, of humanitarian pause. I think that would be far too long for him to be able to accept. I suppose to go back to this Harry Lambert one, I, I do think it is very telling because, I mean, from my perspective, one state or two state, whatever outcome one wants, the reason we haven't had any kind of solution which is remotely satisfactory to both sides is because one side has all the power. Israel has all the power, right? All the power. And so, and then you've got all of these people going on TV saying, oh, we want a peaceful two-state solution, but the only way we can get a peaceful two-state solution is if we take even more power away from the Palestinians and give even more power to the Israelis. If you give more power to the Israelis, they're not going to suddenly say, oh, well, now we've got so much power, even more power than before, now we're going to compromise. Why would they do that, right? The reason we haven't had peace is because Israel has the option of, of, of not having an agreement with the Palestinians. They can say, well, we've got overwhelming force We've got the backing of every country in the world, which seems to, not every country in the world, sorry, every, every Western country in the world, which seems to be basically unconditional. Why do we need to negotiate with these guys, right? Let's just destroy them. And you've got all of these, these liberal commentators who say they're for a two-state solution going up on TV and saying, oh no, we're all, we, we, what we want to do is we want to ask Israel nicely to have a two-state solution while unconditionally backing them to give them even more power than they currently have in a situation where they have nearly all the power. It just doesn't make any sense. It's completely, completely incoherent, whatever end state you want. And that's why I just think it's just incredibly dishonest, ahistorical. How you think that by increasing the power of Israel, they will then compromise is just completely, completely bizarre. Um, Barnaby, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Colonizers don't give up power willingly. I mean, Frederick Douglass, the great American abolitionist, said power concedes nothing without demand. It never did, and it never will. If you live in other people's stolen homes or uh, are engaged in a process of dispossessing them from their homes, you don't stop doing that just because you change your mind. You stop doing it because you're put under pressure. And we know what pressure means. It means international isolation. This is what happened in South Africa through boycotts, divestment, and sanctions. It means strikes and civil disobedience and struggle um, uh, within the uh, colonial power. So Western politicians trying to green light Israel to devastate Palestinians um, and then talk about a two-state solution. Well, that's why I say the two-state solutions become a kind of alibi. You give Israel the freedom to do commit all the violence it wants, and then you say, oh, but don't worry. We know we can't defend the apartheid present, but there's a different world that we're defending, but it'll never come about because Israeli politicians aren't even committed to it. And by the way, that slogan from the river to the sea, it's written into the charter of Likud, the governing party of Israel, Netanyahu's party, from the river to the sea, there will be only Israeli sovereignty. That's what Israel wants. So if we want a world different from that, different from an apartheid reality from the river to the sea, if we want a world of peace and freedom for everyone, then we're going to have to put maximum pressure on the colonizer to try to deliver it. And we're going to have to support the Palestinians in their freedom struggle. Thank you for watching this show. We'll be back again tomorrow from 6 p.m. For now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.